Hello guys, this is going to be the 15th week update on the Ecosphere experiment. And as you can see, a lot has changed in the month since I last posted, so we're going to dive right into it and focus on all the species found in these jars, whether the populations have stabilized, and if the seasonal changes have affected these Ecosphere jars. And remember to like and subscribe if you like these kind of videos. So uh, let's get into it. In the Lake Ecosphere jar, nothing's really changed much, except for the fact that many of the copepods and ostracods' activity have slowed down. As you can see, you can see a lot of them swim by. They like to stay by the bottom of the jar now. And also, algae is beginning to grow all over these rocks, so it's getting a really cool old rustic look, and I like that. And the brush of algae is about to actually reach the bottom, and it's very interesting to see how this algae has thrived and grown. And yes, the flatworms are still here. I saw one, I think, two weeks ago. But I tried to film it, but he hid again. So it's hard to find flatworms whenever you're trying to film. But yeah, this jar has practically stayed the same. It has experienced no seasonal changes. The algae is still purling. And yeah. It's very interesting to see how stable this jar is, but that was to be expected since we got the substrate and the water from the same locations. Now we're going to be moving on to the sand ecosphere jar. Now, for those of you guys who love snails, you're going to be very disappointed. The population has, of course, dropped big time in the sand ecosphere jar, and it's now to a sustainable 10 to 15 snails in this jar from the 200 there were previously. So this is a big improvement. Over here we have a snail who came out of the water. He likes to do that from time to time. And as you can see, the glass is pretty clear now. It's just all clear. And the algae is almost decimated. The 200 snails have done their job, and there's barely any algae. Here's another snail going towards the algae again. But yeah, I thought that the algae would be gone, but it's still here. And the copepod ostracod population have actually spiked due to the decline of snails, so that's good. And the algae is also growing underneath the sand, which is very interesting. When you look at the very bottom, you see this green layer over here? This is algae that's growing from this algae over here. So it's interesting to see how the algae is actually seeping into the sand layer. And what I also found interesting is these copepods and ostracods are coming out of the sand too, which means they have tunnel systems and they burrow as well. So that's very interesting. Now let's move on to the pond rock ecosphere. In the pond rock ecosphere, a lot has changed. The algae actually stopped purling and it has actually went to the pond rock level. And the copepod and ostracods have moved down with it. Before they used to be up in this water column and under the rocks, but now there's nothing up in the water column. And all the copepods and ostracods you can see are all by this algae layer and under the rocks. So it's very interesting to see how this happens. And they're still burrowing, and now you can't even see the dead copepods and ostracods anymore on the bottom because the algae is covering all of it. Their bodies have become a new substrate layer, and it's very interesting to see how the algae is forming and growing from the bottom layer as well. So yeah, this jar has experienced a lot of change. I think that the algae stopped purling because of the seasonal change. Winter is coming, and I'm not sure if this algae knows. It's a different species of algae compared to the other two jars, so it's interesting to see how it dropped due to temperature changes, because my house did get a bit colder. We haven't turned on the heat, so maybe that's why. So it's very interesting to see how certain things can affect the purling ability of algae and the behavior of all the copepods and ostracods, because every single copepod and ostracod is on the bottom. Over here, let's see if we can identify what this is moving around. That's pretty cool. No, my camera's too blurry. You are right there on the rock. Ooh. That looks like a macroinvertebrate of some sort, but what kind of macroinvertebrate? Looks like a larva. It has three tails, maybe a damselfly? No, that's a scud. That's good. I didn't actually know we had any scuds, so when you film, you discover new species you have here, so that's good. Oh, 
East Swamp. So yeah, we have scuds in this jar, which is good. I didn't think we had any scuds, so macroinvertebrates are in this jar, and they must be thriving, so yeah. And before I saw a brine shrimp in this jar, so this is really good. This jar is really thriving, that means, so. The pond rock jar is, I guess you can say, thriving. There's scuds, there's copepods, ostracods, there's snails, but I haven't been able to find the snails since this brush of algae is covering all the snails, so... We'll see what happens. And now let's move on to the final jar for this experiment. And finally, we have this control jar, which is a whole lot of nothingness. As you can see, there's just nothing except algae on the bottom that is starting to grow finally. But yeah, all the organisms have died, or I think have died, because there's nothing in the water column. And when I check the bottom, nothing is... Nothing swimming there, so I'm assuming everything has died in this jar. Which is quite sad, but that was to be expected because, you know, there was no substrate layer. But now, with all the dead bodies on the floor, these are all dead copepods, ostracods, and snails. We're getting actually a healthy growing algae layer, so that's cool. And maybe they laid eggs to copepods and ostracods or snails. So once the algae starts to grow, maybe they'll grow too. I don't know. But yeah, we'll see what happens, and yeah, this for now, this jar is dead, and that's what I was thinking might happen, but you know, it's cool to see my predictions come true, since there was no substrate layer, but it lasted a lot longer than I expected. This lasted about three months, and it officially died within, I think, the fourth month, so yeah, very cool, and... Now we have three jars left, and it's going to be interesting to see if these other three jars will thrive as well, or die out like the control jar did. So, I believe it's time to talk about some conclusions we can make. Some conclusions that can be made is that, for some reason, the pearling effect has stopped in the pond rock jar. And it's not due to snails or anything, but it has stopped pearling and floating. And I think it's probably seasonal change. But I don't actually know. There might be other factors for it. Maybe it's a lack of sunlight, but that doesn't make sense because the sun has been consistent here. But for some reason, it has stopped floating, so I'm attributing it to a seasonal change. The sand ecosystem jar is doing better. The snail population is under control, and the copod and ostracod population is booming. Apparently, they like to lay eggs in sand. I never knew that because like there's thousands of copepods and ostracods coming out of that sand. It's hard to tell how many colonies are in there. And I also learned that the algae, in order to survive the constant grazing of the snails, is starting to burrow, which I never knew algae could do. But it's kind of cool to see it grow from the bottom of the tank all the way to the top. And yeah, the control jar has died. So for a population, the most stable population so far, of course, is the lake ecosphere jar. So this one over here. And that is because the substrate and the water and the algae all came from the same location. And I believe that's what allowed the stability to come here and why there is no big fluctuation in the population. Actually, when you look at the population graphs for this jar, it's all the same. It's interesting. It's just steady, stable, and it never changes. It never really fluctuates anymore. In the beginning, it did, but now this is like the beacon of stability. Over here, in the sand ecosystem jar, we have had a lot of fluctuation over the past four months. From a, an abnormally high copepod and ostracod population to an abnormally high snail population, finally, we're getting, like, I guess, stable numbers of both. It's hard to tell because the copepods and ostracods are now living in the sand and coming out, but at most I see maybe a hundred of them, so that's something. This jar is very interesting because I thought it would die out, but it's still thriving. The algae has found a way to outsmart, I guess you can say, the snails, and it's now going under the sand. Oh, it's very cool. You see that yellow layer on the bottom? That's all algae on the bottom. Fascinating how the algae is just growing into the sand layer to prevent the constant grazing from this guy up here and another snail on top of it right now. But, you know... This is the survival of the fittest, so maybe that's why the snail population has declined as well. The algae has definitely declined. 
because of the constant grazing. And that the algae now is not on the top anymore. It's growing into the sand layer. So it's going to be interesting to see if the snails survive this or if the snails will die out. I think the snails will survive because they're hardy creatures. And I don't believe all the algae will be under the substrate layer. I think some will peek out from time to time. Moving on to the pond rock jar. This jar has by far the most species in it, which is very fascinating since it's just the same water I collected and just pond rocks I had. So it's very interesting to see the scuds in here, uh, the brine shrimp, the copepods and ostracods, the snails, and then I also saw that there is a couple macroinvertebrates. Oh, there is a snail on the back. You can see him slowly going up. Very interesting. But yeah, there's a lot of things in this jar that is just very interesting and fascinating. Wow, that's another species I have never seen before. See, that's the problem with this jar. They all live under the rock layer. Now, that was a macroinvertebrate of some sort. It had, oh, come on, focus. Huh. Oh, yes, that is what we call a nymph, which is actual. Oh, don't move. Oh, man, he has jumped. Let's see if we can find that nymph. Nymphs are very cool and fascinating creatures. There's actually a lot of nymphs. So that's not a nymph, that's the scud. Where did you go, big nymph? Are you here? So yeah, macroinvertebrates are cool. They can use them as a bio-indicator of your health of the ecosystem. Now let's see if we can identify the kind of nymph. It has one, no, two, three spiky tails. It has a mandible. Oh, it's trying to feed on the copepods over there. This is interesting behavior. This is a damselfly nymph. You can tell because it has three tails. One, two, three. And the legs are about six. There's a scud right here. I wouldn't be too close to this. The damselfly nymph is probably going to be the apex predator in this jar. So yeah, it's interesting to see how there's a damselfly nymph in here as well. And it looks like it's on the prowl for food. So yeah, damselflies are really cool. They can hunt. They can sense their prey with their three antenna in the back so like if any copepod or ostracod is in the back and it makes any vibrations it will turn around and snap and yeah they're very good species i mean they like to they tolerate pollutants in the water so um yeah that means that the water i got this from lake whalen has some pollutants but it's interesting to see them thrive in a small jar like this because there's not that much I guess you can say sustainability with the copepods and ostracods, and oh, the scud is doing really well too as well. It's fascinating to see all these species come out after four months, because in the beginning there was barely any species, and honestly I haven't seen scuds or damselflies in the four months since I've been filming this, and it's fascinating to see how they came out. Maybe they lay their eggs in this algae layer and it just took four months for them to thrive or maybe it's a seasonal change that allowed them to come out but you know life is always fascinating that's the perk of having ecospheres many new species come out and you just figure out that there's a lot more life in these jars than you expected and the beauty is that even the dead bodies of these organisms are becoming a substrate as you can see the algae is grass is like grass growing from the substrate layer on the bottom and obviously these organisms are thriving since there's damselflies, scuds, brine shrimp, copepods, ostracods, snails, there's everything in this jar. Nothing lives in the surface of the jar of course except maybe the snail who likes to go up from time to time. Everything now lives at the bottom where the algae is. And now Finally, we are going to be focusing on the control jar, which has died. There's literally nothing. Nothing at all. Just algae growing on the bottom, and that's about it. So yeah, this has been the Ecosphere update. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you have, like, please like and subscribe. And yeah, that's it. The three jars that I think are going to do the best now are probably the Pond Rock jar, 
the Lake Eagle Sphere Jar and the Sand Eagle Sphere Jar. Because I think the Sand Eagle Sphere Jar, even though it's adding huge population fluctuations between different species, it still will thrive since the algae is super hardy in that jar. It's a completely different species from the other two algae, but it's thriving, it's doing well, and it's very fascinating to see how that occurs. So yeah, thank you guys for watching, and uh, have a good day.